Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our advanced training. This morning is Monday, August 19th, 2019, and this is Mike Riches joining the training here this morning. I apologize. I'm, I, I'm a couple minutes behind, and the reason was I had, uh, I had this uh, training on my laptop, and after our uh, national training call, you know, we have a 30-minute uh, pause in between, 30-minute break in between those two calls, as you well know, and... Uh, and my laptop came up and said, "You want to restart and up, and update your, you know, do an update." And so I, I I hit yes, which was probably not a very smart thing. But I thought, you know, I've got 30 minutes here. So anyway, I started to get real nervous when it was uh, 27 minutes after the hour, and it was only 24% done. So I restarted it and I had to undo all the changes. Anyway, that's uh, the long the long way of telling you that I apologize, but I am really glad that at least we're we're live, and I have my training that I can share with you this morning. So, anyway, uh, welcome. I hope that you're uh, hope you're ready to buckle in and and uh, dive into some good information here this morning. Um, I, I want to thank you for taking your time. I know that that's a commitment of time, and y'all have been just absolutely incredible at, at plugging into this training the first two weeks. Um, we've received a lot of activity reports. I want to commend those of you who listened in last week and have been doing activity reports. Some people every day, you know, which is fantastic. Some people uh, are going back and making up for days that they, they missed. Either way is totally fine. As long as we get a report for each day, that's the crucial thing. And just as a reminder, those reports can be submitted at www.reportmyactivity.com. Again, as long as we get a report for every day, that's the that's the key. Even if, you know, I talked to somebody last week. They said, you know, I'm 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 on vacation for two days. That's fine. You can go put zeros in. I did not make any contacts. I did not. What that that is better than not submitting a report for a particular day because it really helps us get the full picture on uh, uh, as, as far as your, uh, your results, as far as looking at your results and being able to, to uh, identify some trends. That's obviously the point of this. And, and uh, so anyway, so thank you to those who are doing that. Really, we've had just an excellent response there. Um, there are some of you that need to go back and do that for last week, and, and you need to make up, finish your days for last week. We've got some where you reported for part of the week, but not all of the week. And so here's my job is to call you to repentance this morning and and, and uh, encourage you to go do that. It's not for me. It's really not. I, it, it's not so that I can see your activity. It's really for you so that we can look at that activity over a consistent period of time and be able to help you. I want to be able to help you identify where you're where you're getting good results and where you could see improvement. Um, I had a great conversation last week with one of our associates, and and she had made a significant number of calls, uh, over 150 calls, the previous week, and uh, had set one appointment. And we were able to kind of break that down. As we looked at her numbers, we we recognized she was doing fine with the gatekeeper because her pass through rate was 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 great it was it was uh it was perfect and so well I, I say it was perfect it was good it was it was right where it needed to be i guess perfect is a relative term perfect would mean they pass you through every time that doesn't happen so but it was good it was uh it was where it needed to be her pass through rate meaning that when you look at the percentage of calls versus the or the number of calls versus the number of decision makers that you speak to, that's what we call your pass-through rate. That means that the the gatekeeper, the receptionist, gatekeeper sounds like such a negative term. So I like, you know, let's call what it is. It's a receptionist. That they're putting you through the right way. That they're not just putting you to voicemail. They don't feel like you're a solicitor. They don't feel like you're a salesperson. They're actually putting putting you through in that, decision maker's phone is ringing. Now, it's only about 10% of the time they actually, on a cold call, will get a decision maker. So that pass-through rate is not going to be 100%. That's why I said perfect, but I wanted to change that. 
because 10% when you're cold calling is, is good. That's fine. Um, but her pass-through rate, going back to this example, her pass-through rate was, was fine, um, and she was getting a, the right number of decision makers, but her appointment rate was not as high. We would like to see more than, than one uh, appointment set out of that many calls. And so we were able to dissect her, her script a little bit, and we found that there were elements of her script that she wasn't as comfortable saying. And, and I'm going to tell you, that can make a big difference. You've got to be comfortable with what you're saying in your prospecting script. It's got to be natural. It's got to be able to flow. Now, I'm not saying it's going to flow on your first call, but sometimes there are some ways that we can tweak it. We can say it a little bit differently to where you, you can be more comfortable. You can be more confident in making those calls and, and therefore typically get better results as well. Well, that's the type of, of uh, analysis that we can run when we have the numbers, when we have the data. And so I would just, again, encourage you to go uh, report that at that website on your screen, www.reportmyactivity.com, and uh, do one of those activity reports for every day um, that, that, uh, that, you're, that you're working the business. Let's, uh, let's move into our topic of conversation this morning. And, uh, and really, this is a seven-week series. But it's kind of one of those things where last week's training on prospecting and today's training on conducting an effective decision maker meeting, these two trainings, I mean, they, this is really where it's at. And, and we're going to talk about effective enrollments. And I thought, by the way, Dave Paperno did a fantastic job talking about effective enrollments this morning. We're going to talk about preparing uh, for those enrollments. We're going to talk about other elements that that are important for our success because, I mean, you can prospect well, you can do a great decision maker meeting, and if you get in front of a, a group of employees and, and uh, you don't do a very good presentation, then you're obviously not going to have the, the, uh, the, the success that you could have if all of those, uh, if all of those were, were in the right place where they really ought to be. But, but this, the reason I say last week and this week are so crucial is because this is where, I mean, as I've been doing this for over 17 years now, and I've worked with a lot of different associates, these are the two areas where we lose people. I mean, really, where, where people struggle the most. And that, that is in prospecting, which that makes sense because everything else leading up to prospecting, there's not a whole lot of rejection. Right. I mean, you think about the the average associate that gets started. They they become an associate. Well, there's not rejection there because as long as they don't have a felony, and and even sometimes if there is a felony on their record, Legal Shield will approve them as an associate. So as long as they have ninety nine dollars, the vast majority of the time, Legal Shield is going to say yes, check. Now you know we've got a new program with professional sellers where that is not necessarily the case. But as far as just becoming an associate with a company. You know, there's not a whole lot of rejection there. Certainly when you're going through training. I mean, you don't click on a video and the video come back and says, you know, hey, I'm sorry, you're not sharp enough to watch this video. I mean, every, you know, if you click on a video, it's going to play. I mean, if you've, got, if you've got a phone or if you've got a computer, you can go through training. Making your list. You know, we tell our associates, make a list of, of uh, individuals. We tell our associates, make a list of companies. You don't write on the list. I guess your pen could run out of ink, but short of that, there's not much rejection in, in making a list. You make a list. You put the names down. Now, starting to prospect those individuals, that, that's where you, you're going to face some rejection. That's where you're going to call some people, and they're going to say no. And I don't want to sugarcoat that because it's the absolute truth. You've got to be ready for that. Well, because of that, we lose some people there. They'll, they'll sign up, they'll go through training, they'll, they'll get a membership, they'll even use their membership, and they'll make a list, they'll get all ready to go, and then they just don't make the phone calls. They just don't reach out and, and do a lot of the activity. And I mean, frankly, there could be other reasons for that, but I think the number one reason is we as human beings tend to not embrace rejection. <laughs> like, we don't love rejection. That's just a human nature kind of a thing. And so it makes sense 
that that would be an area where some people just don't make the cut. They just don't do the activity that's required. And we've got some that they make a few phone calls here and there, but they really don't dive in and do the activity that's required to make a six-figure income. And we that's an area there in prospecting. Well, this, this uh, topic today of conducting an effective decision-maker meeting, and I'll clarify that and specify a little bit in saying it's, it's more where, where we tend to have associates who struggle is not in the meeting itself, but it's closing the meeting. It's, it's uh, converting the meeting into an enrollment. That's an area where we've just seen people struggle with that. And I've had people that, that have very uh, you know, excellent sales background I mean, some of them, 20, 25 plus years of executive professional sales experience, and they get to this point and they struggle. So in other words, they go through training, they make their list, they call, they call the companies, they set up appointments, they go do the meetings. And again, the vast majority of time, the meetings go well. Like it's not that the decision makers are chasing them out of their office. The decision makers aren't saying this sounds stupid. The, the decision makers are nodding their heads, they're giving the right buying signals, they're asking the right questions, and then they get to the end, and they're just not turning those into enrollments. And that's what I want to really dive into. Now, we're going to talk about the entire meeting, but what, what I really want to emphasize today is converting it. Taking an interested decision maker and turning that into an appointment with his or her employees an enrollment, a scheduled enrollment, because that's what it's all about. And then again, we'll talk about that enrollment uh, in future weeks. I mean, you know, I want those enrollments to be successful, but I, I've seen it over and over again. I've seen mediocre presentations lead to people signing up. I've seen bad presentations. I mean, my first enrollment was a perfect example of that. It was not a mediocre presentation. It was a bad presentation. It was really bad. I mean, I think I held the brochure upside down. I, I tell people it was so bad I wanted to go cancel my own membership but before I was done with it. And yet, out of the 12 people that I presented to, five still signed up. So you, you can have a mediocre enrollment presentation and still make money. You can still do okay. But if you're not getting to that phase, if you're not closing decision-maker meetings properly, if you're not converting, again, an interested decision-maker, which is not hard to get, to a scheduled enrollment, which can be a little bit harder to get. If that conversion isn't happening, it doesn't matter because you're not going to be enrolling. And that's what I want to really dive in and focus on this morning. So now we'll backtrack a little bit and, and talk about the meeting itself. How do you have an effective meeting? How do you get that decision maker to be interested? And I'll give you just these tips on the screen. We'll talk about each of these. One of the things that I think is so crucial is watching the time that you spend in a decision maker meeting. So when, when we're talking about a decision maker meeting, those typically take about 20 minutes. Now we've certainly had them go 25, 30 minutes. I mean, I've had decision maker meetings go an hour and we've had decision maker meetings where you sit down with a decision maker and they say, okay, you got 10 minutes. <laughs> And now some of those, you, you need to be able to recognize if it's a decision maker that just doesn't want to give you a whole lot of time, then that's fine. And do a 10-minute presentation, get into it, and, and try to pique their interest. And frankly, if you and I are not able to pique interest in 10 minutes, we don't really need to stay there much longer anyway, right? Because there's nothing that we're going to say in that 16th minute that we couldn't have said in the first 10 minutes that's going to get them to change their mind and say, okay, never mind, I am interested. So if it's one of those, and I've, I've found that those are pretty few and far between, but if it's somebody that's just, okay, look, I said yes to get you off the phone. I really don't care what you have. You got 10 minutes, go. Then, yeah, we need to be able to, in 10 minutes, either pique their interest or not waste our time anymore and just move on to the next decision maker. And that's okay. You're going to have some of those if you're out doing the business the way that you should be. You, you need to be having some of those because that's part of the business. 
You also need to recognize, though, when a decision maker is just overloaded. And sometimes they said yes to the appointment, and then you show up, and everything in their world has fallen apart. They've got an emergency, HR emergency that they're dealing with. They've, you know, production stopped because of a, an equipment malfunction or something like that. And you need to be able to recognize when you've got a decision maker that's just highly stressed. Now, every decision maker is going to be generally busy. But you need to be able to recognize when they're highly stressed, when it's just not a good time. And I've learned this. Even though I, I got dressed, I, I, you know, I got my packet all ready, I got my, you know, I, I look good, I, I got all those things, I drove to the meeting, I've prepared. There are some of those times when it's better to just reschedule and just ask. It, it seems to me like right now may not be a good time. Would it be better for you if we just rescheduled? And again, I don't say that very often, but I recognize when I've got a stressed out decision maker and, and, and I would rather reschedule. I'd rather go back another day, get dressed, get my packet together, drive all the way over there. I'd rather do all of that again to catch them on a better day if, if it's evident that this is just not going to be a good time. And, uh, and I found that when you do offer that in those moments where they are just stressed out and it is a terrible time, then they get this look of relief. And it's like, yes. Actually, yes, that would be great if we could reschedule it. And when you go back at the time that you reschedule for, then you've already started to establish a relationship of trust and you've already got on their good side. And they are so much more willing to listen to what you have to say and to participate than they would have otherwise been. So you and I need to be able to recognize that. Now, having said that, the vast majority of meetings you're going to go in You've asked for 15 to 20 minutes, and that's what you're going to take. And the person is pleasant. They're polite. They, they um, you know, may be somewhat interested when you sit down, but by the time you're done, you're going to have them very interested, and the meeting just goes well. The key is making sure that you're not going much over the time that you asked for. Now, you know, I, I found this. If I get if I ask for twenty minutes, I can turn that into twenty five. And and most people are not gonna be, you know, totally put off by that. But if you've asked for twenty minutes and then you get in there and you you just you know, the conversation's going real well, it's real chatty, the decision makers chatting it up, sometimes they're the ones that are doing all the talking. They're they're the ones that that are uh you know, that that, that are kind of it, making this a longer meeting than, than what you had originally intended. But the problem is if you get in there and you take an hour, if, even if they say, it's okay, it's okay, no, I've got time, no, we're good, even if they kind of insist that that's okay, here's what they're going to remember is you took an hour. And so, you know, on those times where you need to call and follow up, you follow up with somebody that you asked for 20 minutes and it ended up taking an hour, even though it was their quote unquote fault. When they see your number come up on their caller ID, they're going to say, oh, I can't take that call. That guy talks forever. <laughs> you know, it's just that's what happens when you go over your time. So you've got to be a professional. You've got to watch your time. You know, I think part of being a professional is dressing, you know, right for the meeting. And, uh, you know, there's probably a lot that we could say on that. I'll, I'll just say this. You know, you need to dress in a way that what you wear does not distract from what you say or does not detract from what you say. And that could probably be, probably be applied at a lot of different levels. But, you know, if you go into a group where everyone is casual and you're in a full suit and tie, gentlemen, or, you know, you're very overly professionally dressed ladies, then that can almost be a distraction sometimes. It definitely can the other way. If you go into a professional environment, you're in a, you know, jeans and a polo, and I'm kind of using an extreme case there, but, but you know, that, that's, that, that's going to dis detract from your message as well. You know, yeah, I, I got I to gotta make a note of modesty there as well, you know, the, making sure that our dress is a, in a modest way, in a professional way, I don't, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because I think that for the most part we understand that. 
but, uh, but we just need to make sure that we're dressing in an appropriate way, that our dress, what we wear, does not detract from our message or, or what we say. Um, typically, you know, for, for gentlemen, I can say this, and I, and I learned a long time ago with ladies not to really tell you what to wear, and, and I've, I've been pretty happy with that throughout my life. And so, but with gentlemen, uh, you know, typically if you can kind of guess what they're going to be wearing if you're meeting with another, uh, another man, then, uh, you know, if you can kind of guess what they're going to be wearing, typically we want to dress about one step up from that. So, you know, if, if it's uh, an environment where they're in slacks and a dress shirt, maybe maybe we add a tie. If they've got a tie, maybe we add a jacket. I mean, you know, typically if you can shoot for one uh, step up from where they're going to be, then that's great. Will you always know that? No. You know, sometimes, especially if you've prospected over the phone, it can be hard to know what kind of an environment it's going to be. And we're going to, you know, probably find ourselves a little overdressed or a little underdressed sometimes. Um, and that's okay. If you're being field trained, watch what your field trainer does. And, and it's okay to uh, shoot the, your field trainer a text and say, hey, how are you going to be dressed today so that I can kind of uh, mirror that. But, you know, if your field trainer shows up and they've got, uh, you know, a, a slacks and a dress shirt, if it's a gentleman, and they've got slacks and a dress shirt, you want to kind of match that as well. You know, you don't want to be underdressed from the person that you're with, especially if you're the field trainee, if you're the one that's being field trained. You don't want to be overdressed from, from where your field trainer is as well. So, you know, again, that can be coordinated, um, uh, you know, before the, before the meeting starts. I remember years ago, I was fairly new, and I remember somebody asked me that question. I was going to go do a meeting with them, and they sent me a message and said, what, what kind of dress are you going to be uh, in? And, and I thought it was kind of weird when I first heard it. I was like, you know, why is this guy asking me what I'm going to be wearing? Well, the more experience that I got, the more I recognized that's a very sharp and professional thing to do. To, and, and here's why he asked. He didn't want to be overdressed. He didn't want to be underdressed. And, uh, and so I, I really learned to appreciate that. That was a mark of professionalism that I just I, I hadn't really thought of before I saw it. Um, and, and part of that, because my experience before I was with Legal Shield was being a college student. And, and you didn't have that in college you know, classes very often. We're going to talk today about building a relationship of trust. We'll get into more detail, but again, such a, an important aspect of conducting an effective meeting. People do business with those that they, that they like and trust, that they like and trust. Those are the two. If they like you and they trust you, they're going to want to do business with you. And then this final bullet point here on selling the plan, I'll just say this. Um, well, let me, let me break down how I would spend my 20 minutes in a decision maker meeting. And I've done this with some of you before, but, but let me just break that down. What would that look like? How would Mike Riches spend you know, his 20 minutes or my 20 minutes in a decision maker meeting? And the first four or five minutes, I would focus on the decision maker. You know, that's, that's where a lot of that building a relationship of trust would be done in that first four or five minutes. I would look for pictures on the wall. I would look for a degree that's hanging there. I would look for anything in their office that would be a good conversation starter um, and just get them talking about themselves. I would ask them some questions, um, you know, about themselves. Uh, you know, how long have they been with the company? Now, I might know that before I go in because I've looked them up on LinkedIn. And if they just started three months ago, I might not bring it up. But if they've been there for 15 years, I, I would look up the company. I'd have something positive about the company. And then maybe ask how long they've been there. They say 15 years. And I'd say, well, that, you know, your leadership has obviously been a part of, of your growth or, you know, some kind of way to compliment them professionally and appropriately. But that would be the first four to five minutes. I would spend through the next 15 to 16 minutes, I would spend about two minutes and it wouldn't be all at once. It would be kind of sprinkled throughout. But I would spend a total of about two minutes talking about how offering legal and identity theft plans to their employees is going to be a benefit for the company. I would hit on things like we can help reduce absenteeism. 
because people aren't taking time off to, to go to traffic court and people aren't taking time off of work to deal with identity theft and cleaning up their, their identity or, or their children's identity. I would talk about increased focus while they're at work because we can help resolve major concerns in their life, they're going to be less stressed out. That's going to lead to a more positive work environment. It doesn't take long for a personal problem to become a personnel problem. I would talk about how that can even increase productivity. I would, I would mention those things, but of my 20 minutes, only about two minutes would I spend on how this is going to help the company. And the rest of that time, so 13 to 15 minutes, I would spend on the plan itself. I would spend on the, and when I say the plan, the legal and the identity theft plan, I would get into those two products and I would show them exactly what these products do. And I would do it in a way that is very similar to how I'm going to present these plans to their employees. So it would not be a high level overview. But I would actually dive in and show them the, the, the aspects, show them the details. I want to use the same emotion that, I use, that I'm going to use with their employees in that decision maker meeting. I would share the same stories. I would use the same emotional language. We'll talk about some of that uh, in, in coming weeks when we get into the enrollment. But I'm gonna, it's going to be persuasive. Now, I might use a little different language. So instead of you, I might say they, referring to their employees. So instead of saying you can get a will done your very first month if you choose to, I might say they could get a will done their very first month. So in that sense, I would change the language a little bit, but I would not change the emotion. I would not change what I, what I uh, spend time on in a presentation. I would not change any of that. All of that would be similar, and here's why. If I can get a decision maker to say at the end of a decision maker meeting, if I can get a decision maker to say, this sounds really good. In fact, I think I'd sign up for that. <laughs> and some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. To me, that's how I know that I've done a good job, is if I can get the decision maker to basically say, this is a good plan, I'd buy it. That's where I want to get them mentally. And the reason is because if I can get them there, then I've just overcome a pretty good portion of the objections that they might have. Now, we're going to talk about some of those potential objections here in a minute. But I'm telling you, a lot of the objections that you're going to face in a decision-maker meeting, you can overcome those naturally, organically, just by basically selling the plan, selling, and I'm not saying that you necessarily take out a membership form and sign up the decision maker. That's not what, I'm, what I mean by sell the plan. But I am saying that you can, you can get them on board mentally and emotionally. They, they can buy in, quote unquote, to wanting this membership themselves. And then it is a natural, easy bridge to make to, to where their employees would want it as well. And that's the point that I'm making there. I used to do that the exact opposite, by the way. So again, my breakdown today, four to five minutes uh, building relationship with the decision maker, two minutes kind of sprinkled throughout the meeting of how this is going to benefit the company, and then the, the majority of time, 13 to 15 minutes, how this is going to benefit the employees themselves. I used to do that kind of reverse. I would do a real short, high-level overview of the product, and then spend the bulk of my time in a meeting talking about how this is going to benefit the company. And I learned to reverse that and spend the bulk of the time talking about how it's going to benefit the employees. And my results went through the roof. They were so much higher than when I was so focused on how this is going to help the company. So I hope that that's helpful. Okay, let's uh, oops, get back here. Next uh, slide here talks about what to bring to a decision maker meeting. And I, I've, I've made this point on webinars before, but I'll, I think it bears repeating. I believe that when it comes to making a packet, whether it be the decision maker packet or the enrollment packet, I really believe that less is more. Now, not, I do not mean by that that, it, that your packet should be less professional. I'm talking about the content 
of your packet because it should be very professional and we should be using corporate pieces and you know not photocopying things and you know that there's a way to have a small packet and not be a good packet because it's not professional and and unfortunately we don't have a ton of that within our organization but we've seen some of that 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 they need to really focus on professionalism and 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 so that's not my point here but when i when i say let, less is more i am not a big believer in overloading that decision maker with a ton of information there are tons of things that are good information that i choose not to include in my dm packet simply because I'm focused on my nonverbal communication and I don't want to communicate nonverbally that this is a big decision. That's not my message. And if I hand somebody a huge packet of information, that's exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying, look, you, you really should go review all of this. You really should look this over. This is a pretty big decision. No, I don't want to say that. I don't want to communicate that. I want to communicate this is simple. In fact, let's schedule an enrollment today. That's what I want to communicate, and I find that just having a simple packet allows me to do that. Now, what does that look like? Well, um, I would include a legal shield or ID shield branded folder, and you can get those with your marketing dollars at uh, thelegalshieldstore.com. A legal shield or ID shield branded folder in that proposal, or excuse me, in that folder. I would typically include a proposal. Now, you can do a self-serve proposal right on lsengage.com. In fact, you know what? I'm going to come out of the PowerPoint here and just show you what that would look like. We go to lsengage.com. You're going to have to log in with your associate ID here. All right, you're following me. You log in. You're just going to click up here where it says Resources, right up here at the top. And as you click on resources, when you scroll down, you're going to go to Business Solutions, Employee Benefit Proposals. Now, I'll just show you above that is where it says Decision Maker Material. I mean, those things, those are more for you, okay? So, um, so, so that's, I mean, you know, there is a, a, a PowerPoint presentation that you could, that you could download. I'm not big on using a PowerPoint in a Decision Maker meeting. I've done it once or twice. I prefer just to have more of a relaxed conversation and not make it as formal. Now, that is one person's preference. But, but I, where I'm showing you is where it says employee benefit proposals and inserts here. And here you've got a wide variety of proposals that you can use. Um, I, I'll show you the one that I like is right down here, B2B proposal uh, or B2B employee benefits. Um, Where is that? Maybe it's not the three bureau. It's, I think it's the one bureau. And I wonder. No, that's not it. Well, I'm sorry, guys. I should have had this before. ID Shield proposal. Those are just on ID Shield. I like them with the legal, but I was looking for just the one bureau. But you could put the three bureau in there. That's fine. Um, so, it, again, I'll just show you where it says three bureau legal shield and ID shield combo proposal. Uh, that would be the one, I thought they had one that was just with the one bureau, but I'm not seeing it here. They may have, uh, there may be editing that because this is a new design. So anyway, but that's, uh, this is the proposal that you could use. Now you could get that printed at like a uh, UPS store or a FedEx Kinko's. I would be real careful printing this on a home computer unless you've got a nice color laser printer where it's going to look professional, I would take it to a, you know, a, a, a UPS store or something like that and have it printed so that it just looks sharp. And you can ha have them bind this as well, uh, you know, which is fine. But that proposal works pretty well. Let me just show you here. We'll go to the LegalShieldStore.com and I'll just show you the folders that, that I'm talking about. If you click on Use Marketing Dollars up here, uh, that'll take you to the marketing dollars page. This is the legal shield pocket folders. It's six ninety five, but that's for ten of them. So they come out to like seventy cents each. So that's not a bad deal. 
and they have some that are ID Shield branded as well. Now I said either the proposal or the flat sheets, and I'll show you those flat sheets is this one right here. This is the Legal Shield flyer. That's the flat sheet. And there's one on here for identity theft. I think it's a couple pages back, but there's one on here for identity theft as well. And those two flat sheets in a folder, that works as well. Again, I would order them from here because they come on nice cardstock or get them printed on like a glossy cardstock uh, through the UPS store. But, but either, either the uh, proposals or the flat sheets work really well. You don't need both. So if you have a proposal, that's what you're going to use to go over the membership, and you don't need the flat sheets. If you're going to use the flat sheets, you don't really need a proposal. So either or on that. And then the only other thing that I would really want to include for sure is a list of references. Now you may may not have, if you're just getting started, you may not have a list of references yet. And, and that's okay, you need to build that list of references. We do have a couple of those, or a few of them, available in the success team back office that you can find. But the best thing is to build your own list of references, obviously with companies that you're doing business with, that's that's preferable. But sometimes, you know, you'll call Legal Shield and and uh, and they'll tell you that, you know, there's a group that's already active that you're not going to call on. Some people will will use some of that information some sometimes to build your list of references. You know, I think that that's a that's another way to to build that, or just in in um, in conversations that you have. This is what I would probably prefer: is that if you're having a conversation with a with another associate, that you know they mention, "Hey, I'm working with a group." You can ask them, "Would you mind if I just listed that group on a list of references that I could give to a potential client?" And and usually an associate would be okay with that. So. Anyway, but, but a list of references can be a good thing, even if it's not super long. If it's just, you know, eight to ten businesses is fine. I mean, it, you know, I think it's nice when it's a little bit larger than that. But, but, uh, but that list of references just shows that decision maker that they're not the first ones. And, and that's the key here. Nobody wants to be the first. Now, you're not including uh, phone numbers or contact names. It's just the name of the organization, the company or municipality, or government, or school, or whatever. Um, it's just the name of the organization that's on that list of references. So it's not like you're giving them uh, the green light to call all those places, because we do want to protect our active groups as well. And if you do have a decision maker that says, I would like to talk to one of your active clients, then that's fine. We can definitely get that. And if you don't have one, you can call the home office, and they can get them somebody. They can get them a a reference in their area that they can call. But in those cases, if they really do want to call and talk to somebody, then you would definitely want to check with that the uh, decision maker first, excuse me, with the active client first, and get their permission before you share their information. And, and that way they can be watching out for their call as well. And in those cases, make sure it's somebody that's going to say good things about you, <laughs> about Legal Shield and ID Shield as well. So those three things are the things that I would absolutely want in my decision maker packet. And if that was all I had, those top three, that would be okay. Now you could put in an article in that packet as well. And we've got a couple good articles in our uh, success team back office that you can pull from. And you could uh, put the group authorization form in there if you wanted to. Although I typically don't. But you could. There's nothing wrong with that. I, t I say I typically don't. It's not that I'm anti getting the form signed. Again, I just think that less is more. And I almost prefer after I set the enrollment to go back and get them to fill out the group authorization form at a later time or to email that form to them and have them fill out like a fillable PDF of that form. That's what I would typically prefer to do, but that's just one person's opinion. We've got plenty of people that put that form in their packet as well. I think the key is not having it to be, you don't want it to be a big, heavy packet. You just want it to be light. You want it to be simple and straightforward. And then notice the last thing here that I mentioned is that gift. Um, now, if you've prospected the company in person, 
and already brought them a mug of chocolates, then sometimes a second gift isn't ne uh, absolutely necessary, but it probably wouldn't hurt to bring in a second gift. Just show them, hey, I really appreciate your time. If you've prospected over the phone, then this would absolutely be an area where you'd want to bring a gift. And by the way, I mentioned last week when we were talking about prospecting that if you're prospecting in person and you're doing mugs full of, of uh, good chocolate, I don't, I don't know that the Legal Shield branded mugs are absolutely necessary. I just don't know that they're necessary. They're nice, but I don't know that they're necessary. If you're bringing a gift to a decision maker, don't be afraid to use a Legal Shield branded mug. And let me, uh, let me see if we can find that here on the search bar. And you can see here we've got several different options. All of these options have uh, this little green circle, which means that they're eligible for Legal Shield marketing dollars. So if you wanted to use just an ID Shield mug or just a Legal Shield branded mug, if you wanted a mug that has uh, both brands, one on each side, and you can see here there's 7.95 ease. So, I mean that's not that's not cheap. You can do a dozen for 90 bucks. But that's not, you know, that's not inexpensive. But if you're talking about um taking this into a decision maker at a meeting, then that's a pretty reasonable investment to to make. So, anyway, okay. That's what I wanted to cover on bringing to a decision maker meeting. Now, let's talk about what you're going to cover in that meeting. I already kind of broke down how I like to spend that time, but I want to dive into this a little bit more in depth. I mentioned, you know, that establishing or furthering, de further, further developing, I should say, a relationship of trust. And I say it that way because, you know, again, if you're working your warm market, which is the list that we made, you know, of 30 companies, I, had, I asked you to, to make a list of 30 companies from your warm market, and I think that many of you could, could get more than 30 companies from your warm market. But some of those warm market contacts, you're already going to have a relationship with. You already know the person. And maybe you're not best friends, but maybe you know them from church or, you know, maybe it's a, you know, a former business contact. And so sometimes it's not going to be establishing a relationship of trust, but it's going to be furthering uh, that relationship that's already there, further developing that relationship that's already there. I really like this trust formula. I went to a training last, uh, last year with Hap Cooper, and Hap is a, an individual that he helps companies develop their training, and he's working with Legal Shield Business Solutions right now to further develop the, uh, the business solutions training that we're providing, and I'm really excited for the difference that Hap can make. One of the things that he talked about was this trust formula, C equals, I'm sorry, T, trust, equals C times I over R. And here's what those, uh, the, and some of you may be familiar with this already, but here's what that means. Trust is the T equals credibility times intimacy divided by, what do you think that R stands for? And the R is for risk. Trust equals credibility times intimacy divided by risk. Let's just break down what, what each of those might mean. Credibility is very important to a decision maker. If a decision maker feels like you're not really a credible source, they are typically not going to let you come talk to their employees. Because if you're not a credible source, then that's going to damage their per, uh, perception or their employee's perception of them, I should say if they're bringing in somebody that doesn't really know what they're talking about. That's why, even if you're new, you would never want to necessarily say that to a decision maker. Or if it's a warm market contact and you're calling you know, somebody from, uh, you know, from a previous business relationship or you're calling a friend or a family member or you're calling you know, somebody from church that owns a company, that's where having that field trainer can be so crucial. Because if they know that you're just starting this, then that credibility, their perception of your credibility, is probably going to be pretty low. 
Now, you can change that by going in and just blowing their minds with how much you know about this. And, and I'm not saying that you should go vomit all the, all the facts and all the information that you've learned in your training. But, but you can present yourself as extremely competent in this material and well-trained if you've applied the training. For example, a new associate goes and watches that sample decision-maker meeting in, in our training three or four times and they really learn the information that's presented there, they can sound very credible, even though, even though they don't have a ton of experience uh, in this, with this particular company or with these particular products. But that credibility is a key. The intimacy goes back to how, how much do they like you? How comfortable are they with you? And that can be kind of tough sometimes because the credibility, it's more about the information. Now, it's your mastery of the information, but it's about the information. Intimacy is all about you. So if they view you as unprofessional, if they get a sense that you are desperate to make this deal happen because you need the commission, if it's, you know, if your interests are self-serving, in any way, if that's the, the impression that you give off, that I is going to be a very low number. Now, it's hard to put a you know, measurable number to this, but, but you know, if you put them on a scale, to ten, a scale of 1 to 10, and someone goes in with credibility, I mean, they know their stuff, and their credibility is a 9 out of 10, but their intimacy is a low number, so they, they don't seem like the kind of person that a, uh, that a business is going to want in front of their employees, the type of individual, rather, that a decision maker is going to want in front of their employees. They don't like them. They're not likable. If, that, if, if we as associates are not likable, if that intimacy is a low number, say, for example, a two, then nine times two is 18. That's not starting very high. Okay? And notice it's times. It's not plus. Because you could have a 10 out of 10 on, on uh, intimacy, like, like you know, you're going to your best friend, for example. But if they feel like your credibility is a zero, then it's a zero. <laughs> and you're not going to get the group. Even though you know them and you, you're going to go play golf together this week, and, I mean, you're just you know, best buddies forever and ever, if they feel like the credibility is a zero. It's not plus. It's zero. It's time. It, it, it'll, it'll be a low number. And then, of course, divided by the risk. And that's the question on a decision maker's mind is, what's the downside of it? What's the potential downside of this offering? And that's where overcoming concerns and, and overcoming objections is going to be so crucial is you've got to be able to minimize that risk. Because if you have you know, a high credibility and a high intimacy, but there appears to be a high risk, then they're still not going to go. They're still not going to say yes. They're going to want to review this and think about it before they give you a date for the enrollment. So all three of those things have to be in place. You have to show that you're credible. You have to be somebody that they know, like, and trust. And you have to show that there's not much risk in offering this. You need to be able to overcome some of, some of those objections like, what if my employees use this against me? What if my employees don't sign up? What if it's a waste of time. What if this looks bad? A, you know, an HR person, what if my com employees go complain to the owner and I look bad for offering this? All of those are very real risks in their mind that you and I have to be able to mitigate. Now, let me move into, you know, as far as talking about what to, what to cover. We talked earlier about focusing on the plan. There's a lot that can be said about needs-based selling. If you go in just with the, the same verbatim presentation every time to a decision maker, you're probably not focused on needs-based selling, right? Needs-based selling is finding out, ascertaining what the client needs, and then showing them how our product fills that need. Now, there, there are uh, ways that we can do that in a, in a way that we're going to be able to fill company need. And, and you know, for example, if a company, and I mentioned this earlier, if a company has a problem with absenteeism, if a company has a problem with turnover, 
you know, an HR person might be tired of having to go out and hire new employees. Well, one of the ways that they can retain their employees is to offer a better benefits package. And so there are concepts that we can present that would help fill the needs of the company. But again, I already broke this down for you, how my decision maker meeting would look. And I mentioned two minutes out of 20 on how we help the company. That's 10%. I mentioned 13 to 15 minutes on how we help the employees. That's 70 to 80%. I mean, that's, that's where we're going to spend the, the, the time. And what needs are we filling in that section? And the answer is the needs that our membership uh, fills the solutions that our membership provides. That decision maker probably needs to have a will written or updated. That decision maker may be dealing with an issue right now that an attorney could help. That decision maker has probably been concerned with identity theft, and certainly with our presentation and the information we can share, that concern will, will become even more real and more top of mind. And so we're showing, by focusing on the product, we're showing that we can not only help, help meet the needs of the company, but that we can help meet the needs of that decision maker and, and this is the big and, and their employees. Because again, that's the connection that they tend to make, is if we can show them that they would benefit from this plan, then it's natural for them to, to assume that their employees will benefit from this plan. And that's what I mentioned earlier, getting the decision maker to say, I want it myself. I want this plan. I want to sign up for it. I mentioned we would talk about some of these objections, but just look at look at the first half of these, right? And can you see where if you can get the decision maker to say, I want this, I would sign up for this, you see where some of these just disappear like our folks don't participate in voluntary benefits, and is it worth taking time to present these plans? My employees make minimum wage. I mean, it, really, if you can just get them sold on this is a really good plan at a, at a really affordable price, most of these just go away. I don't think they'd be interested. Let me pull my employees. Let me pull my employees as them saying, I don't know that they're going to like this. And I don't want to do any it's that It goes back to that risk. I don't want to do anything that's going to look bad on me or shed neg negative light. That's going to, you know, it, it, I just want to make sure that they're going to be interested first. That's a decision maker not sold on the benefit. They have, they are not emotionally invested in this benefit. If they if they were, then they likely would not say that. I mean, that's that's why we get some of these objections is because we're just not selling them enough. And again, I, I say selling them. I'm not, taking, I'm not talking about signing them up. I'm talking about getting them to where they're like, wow, this sounds really good. Now, let me, uh, let me just kind of cover some of these. And, you know, again, whenever we talk about overcoming objections, the best time to overcome an objection is before it arises. So let's make that clear right up front. If you wait until they say, let me pull my employees, then you try to overcome that, then it doesn't work as well. But if you say throughout your presentation, if you say, and I like to say this, by the way, at the point where I get to the pricing, which in a decision maker for me, in a decision, decision maker meeting for me, is typically towards the end of that meeting. And I like to see no wonder we have, you know, 50 to 70% of employees that are signing up. I mean, this is an incredible price and they're getting an incredible discount for an amazing product. And, and I, you know, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but, but I'm dripping with belief. <laughs> I'm dripping with con conviction when I'm talking about these things, because I really do believe that their employees need this plan. And I really do believe that their employees can afford this plan. And so I'm dripping with that. They can feel that from me. And then I might say something like, 50 to, you know, no wonder 50 to 70% of employees are signing up. Now, it's one of those things, if you went and polled your employees, the interest wouldn't be very high because they just don't know what they don't know. But if we can get in front of them and get that 10 to 15 minutes, then it just creates a paradigm shift. And all of a sudden, 
they get it and they want it. Most people, if you ask them about a legal plan, they're going to say, no, I don't get sued. But when, they, when I can talk to them for 10 or 15 minutes, and it takes a few minutes to, to get them to understand this, but when I can, and all of a sudden they have a paradigm shift and they realize, wow, no, I could use this for stuff that I'm dealing with right now. And once they understand that, that's where 50 to 70% of them sign up. That's how you could overcome the polling my employees before it ever arises. Now, again, do you have to do that in every meeting? I don't know. But if you're getting that objection, then you might want to add that as part of your presentation. What about these? Uh, this this uh, uh, concern here? Oops, I'm sorry. I don't think you were looking at the right. Okay, sorry about that. Here's the here's the page. Sorry, I was looking at the wrong screen. Uh, what about this concern here about open enrollment? You know, that's to me one of the great advantages of offering these two plans, the legal and the identity theft plan, is that you don't have to offer them during open enrollment. So when you have someone that says, you know, we just had open enrollment. Great. This is, and here's how you answer that. This is not a Section 125 benefit. Now, you again, you could preempt that. You don't have to wait for them to say that. You could say one of the nice things about this, these plans is they're not Section 125 benefits. Section 125 is like a cafeteria plan. These are not Section 125 benefits. And many of the clients that we work with offer these off-cycle. And that way it doesn't get, you know, uh, combined in with everything else. And the employees can actually focus on this and, and make a good decision. Now, some companies, even though you say that, even though you try to overcome it, some companies are going to say, well, we prefer to wait till open enrollment. Right now is actually a really good time to be calling on companies. It's why this is such a crucial time of the year, because in August, uh, businesses are making decisions on benefits that they can offer during open enrollment fourth quarter. Because so many companies, their start date is January 1st. And so their open enrollment is in the fourth quarter. When do they look at those benefits? Mid to late August. So, I mean, we're in that zone right now. It's why, the, it's why your prospecting numbers ought to be double what they normally are. This is the week to make 300 calls when you normally would make 150. I mean, it, it's, you want to you want to really double down right now on prospecting and adding businesses to your pipeline because it's just a great time. Now, does every company do it January 1st? No, of course not. You've got some that will do it, you know, March 1st and April 1st and July 1st and October 1st. I mean, we got them all across the spectrum. But, but, a, but a bunch of them, a lot of companies, they are making their benefits decisions right now for an open enrollment in fourth quarter. And it's okay, even though we can offer these off cycle, especially if the open enrollment is coming up, you'll have a lot of companies that will say, let's do this as part of our open enrollment. And that's okay, it's not a bad thing to do it as part of their open enrollment. But, uh, but you just wanna make sure that, you're, that they understand that they don't have to wait till open enrollment. And that way, if their open enrollment was July 1st and you're meeting with them late August, they're not waiting till next summer to do this. This uh, third to the last uh, objection here, can our employees use the legal plan against our company? That is a very important objection that we want to overcome in every decision maker meeting that we're doing. We want to make it very clear that the employees cannot use it against the company. And sometimes it's not just for the decision maker that you're talking to, but there's usually someone else that they're going to bounce this off of between the meeting, uh, between your DM meeting and the enrollment. If it's the owner that you're meeting with, he or she will bounce this off of a spouse or a business partner or even some of their employees. If it's an HR person that you're meeting with, then they might bounce it off of the owner. Even if they agree to a date, which many of them do, agree to a date for your presentation, they still are probably going to bounce this off of a, an owner or a CEO or a high-level exec, depending on the size of the company. 
but they're going to bounce us off. And sometimes overcoming that objection on can our employees use the legal plan against our company, sometimes it's more important to overcome it for that second person than the decision maker that you're actually meeting with. Let me explain what I mean. If I'm meeting with Susan, who's the HR director, and John is the owner of the company, Susan may not have even thought about what if you know if we offer our employees an attorney, could that come back to bite us? Could they use the legal plan against us? Susan might not even think about that. And I could overcome it in a very simple way and just say we, we amend the policy so that they can't use them against the company. And it might be enough for Susan that she nods and says, okay. But the problem is when she goes and talks to John, the owner, and John does pick up on that. Susan's saying, you know, that we give them an attorney, they can get wills done. And John says, hold on. You're saying that we're going to give our employees an attorney? Well, what about the ones that want to sue us? And usually it's the 99% of them, that's not an issue. But most employers have that 1%, that one or two people, you know, that, that they're kind of a question mark. And that's who the owner's concerned about. I want to have overcome that objection so strongly with Susan that she feels confident in overcoming that objection with John at a later time. And so I want to make this super clear. And this is, I'm going to share with you the language that I actually use here. And I usually will bring this up myself. I don't wait for Susan to ask about it or the HR person or whoever I'm talking to. I don't wait for the decision maker to ask about it. But I bring it up when I get to the part in the legal plan where it talks about writing letters. And I'll usually share a story about, you know, uh, an insurance company or uh, we had John Markham share this morning about buying a uh, home and the home description wasn't right and the member was going to have to eat $1,200. They had their law firm write a letter on their behalf and, and they were able to resolve that to where they, they didn't have to pay that $1,200 themselves. Well, I'm going to share some story like that, and usually the decision maker is nodding their head. They understand it, and that's when I'll add now, let me make sure that I make this clear, that your employees will not be able to use the plan in any way, shape, or form. Listen to my language here. In any way, shape, or form against your company, we actually amend each of their plans to where they can never use it against the company. Actually, even if they leave your company, if they get terminated or they quit and they drop their plan and sign up five years later for an individual plan, it will always show on their permanent record that they once worked for you and had this benefit through you, and they will never be able to use it against your company. It's lifetime indemnity for your company. Now, that you know, it takes all of 30 seconds to say that. It's not like it's, you know, it needs to be a 10-minute thing. But do you hear where I'm being pretty strong on that point? Again, it's not just for Susan. But I want to be strong enough that Susan, when she's talking to John, and John brings that up, hold on, you're saying that we're going to give our employees an attorney? What if they use it against us? I want Susan to be confident and say, no, we actually spoke about that. And, and they, and they uh, amend all the plans. They can never use it against our company, ever. It's lifetime. And so John says, oh, well, good. Yeah, that sounds good. I want her to be confident enough to overcome that, uh, that objection with whoever she talks to. Even if Susan is the owner of the company and she brings it up to her assistant and her assistant mentions that, I want her to be confident that, that we have overcome that objection. I hope that makes sense. Um, the last two here, the last two objections on the screen deal with payroll deduction. Now, this is something that if you're like me, when I go into a company, I typically prefer payroll deduction. And, and in fact, I'm going to assume that they're going to do payroll deduction. Now, if you're talking to a company, obviously, there are some exceptions to that. Because if you're talking to a company that's under 20 employees, then I might not make that assumption. That would be more of let me ask them if they do other benefits and, and uh, you know, how, how, are, how is that, how are those other benefits administered if they do offer? Which, by the way, let me just do a little sidebar here. 
that as soon as I'm done uh, building relationship for the first four or five minutes with a decision maker in my meeting, that is my transition. As I say, well, let me share with you some of this information. Do you mind if I ask you a couple questions first? And my questions are, what kind of, number one, what kind of benefits do you offer right now? And I'm listening there because if they offer a, a benefits package, and especially if they offer voluntary benefits, anything on a voluntary front, so like AFLAC, Colonial, accident plans, cancer plans, pet insurance, anything voluntary, then I know that they're accustomed to doing payroll deduction and I'm going to assume payroll deduction. If I'm meeting with a, a mechanic shop that has eight employees and I say, what kind of benefits do you currently offer? And the owner says, not really nothing. Then I am not going to assume payroll deduction because they're, they're not going to be able to set that up. They're not going to want to set that up. I'm probably just going to proceed with assuming that it's a self-pay at that point. Or another exception to payroll deduction would be if it's a real estate office, you know, and, and their 1099 agents are not receiving a, a weekly or biweekly or monthly check, then we're not going to do payroll deduction there. But the vast majority of the time, I'm going to assume payroll deduction. Well, if you're like me, then that's where these objections are going to come up. Now, if I say, for example, and this is how I this is how I bring it up in my presentation. If I say to the decision maker at the end of the product, when I say, when I get into pricing and I say, if you look at both of these are only $38.90 a month for both plans for a family, and that comes out to $8.98 a week out of their check, it's really affordable. No wonder 50 to 70% of employees are signing up for this. And did you hear how I brought up payroll deduction without really bringing up payroll deduction? I just said, which breaks down to $8.98 a week out of their check. Now, sometimes the decision maker will ask a clarifying question. Is, so is this through payroll deduction? And I've learned just to say yes. Because it's, them asking that is usually not an objection. They're just clarifying. If it's an objection, that's where you're going to run into these last two here. They're going to say something like, well, that's going to be a problem because I've got my payroll person so overloaded right now. It's just one person she's doing for the entire company or he's doing just for the entire – and I just – I cannot overwhelm them anymore. And, and at that point, I would talk about how these plans are easy to administer and, you know, they're – there are no claim forms, no term forms. But I will say this, if they're just dead set that they're not going to do payroll deduction, and, and the, the final bullet point there is kind of the same, that we just don't have a slot. We can't do it. If they're dead set against it, I'm probably just going to go for the easy yes, and I'm probably just going to transition to self-pay at that point and set them up as a self-pay group. Excuse me, there's nothing wrong with that at all. And so, you know, it's, it's not all about overcoming every one of these. Some of this is just what's going to work best for the client and finding a way to be able to, to, to work within those parameters that the employer has set, that the, that the company has set. And that's the case with open enrollment. I mean, if they say, no, look, we're going to do this during open enrollment, I'm not going to object to the point where I kick myself out of the out of the meeting, out of the group. No, I, I just told you, you don't have to do open enrollment. It's not a Section 125 benefit. Why can't we just meet tomorrow? You've got to be careful there because what happens to the trust formula and that I for intimacy just falls apart. Well, well by the way, the R for risk is increasing there because if I'm acting like this with them, then that's how I'm going to, you know, that's how I would act in front of their employees, and all of a sudden the risk goes up. So I'm going to be careful. Sometimes it's it's just about, you know, taking the easy yes. But I wanted to show you some of these so that you're prepared for for some of this to come up. And again, if I can get the employer, if I can get the decision maker rather to say, 
that they want it, that it sounds really good to them, that's how I overcome the majority of these before they ever arise. Okay, now I want to get into, the again, to me, the most important part of a decision maker meeting, which is the close. Now, I like what Dave Fraperno said on our call this morning. He said, ABC stands for always be closing. He was speaking specifically of, of the enrollment, and he talks about how he's kind of closing all throughout the enrollment. Well, I could not agree more with Dave, but it also applies to a decision-maker meeting as well. I'm asking questions that are going to help me determine how I'm going to close this group right from the very beginning. Again, what kind of benefits do you offer? And I never did finish that thought. I apologize. The second question there is, uh, have you ever looked at offering an identity theft plan? I just want to know their experience with that. Most of them, they haven't. But if they say, for example, you know, we, we looked at an identity theft plan or we, you know, we did that a year ago and we decided not to do it, I want to know why, you know, what went into that thinking, what was part of that decision, so that I can uncover some of those concerns and, and, uh, and potentially resolve them. So, but anyway, I'm asking questions all throughout my meeting. Another question that I'm going to ask is, uh, do you do any kind of a staff meeting? Do you do any kind of uh, safety meeting? Do you have anything where your employees are already together? And I'll show you here in the next few minutes where that's going to come in to my close. A big question I'm, that I'm not necessarily asking the decision maker, but that I need to determine the answer to myself is, is what is the goal here? And, and really, another way to ask that question is, is this the actual decision maker? Because sometimes when you're setting meetings on the phone, for example, you think that you've got the decision maker, but then they're really not the decision maker. They might be a, you know, a benefit specialist, but there's a VP of HR that is ultimately going to have to sign off on this. And it can, and, and things that you can look at here are the size of the company. Because if you have an HR director and they only have 50 employees, that's probably the decision maker. Versus if you have an HR director and they have 500 employees, it may not be because there might be a VP of HR or a senior VP of HR. You know, is the company public? Are they private? Most companies that we deal with are private. Well, maybe the owner is going to be involved. Um, in another, the final bullet point, how long has this person worked there? That's another big one because I could have an HR director that has been there for 25 years. And even though there's a VP of HR and an owner, if that HR director has been there for 25 years, you can you better believe that they're, the, they're a decision maker. And, and, and so all of those things, well, let me finish that thought, versus – I could have a senior VP of HR, a company that has 175 employees, and I'm talking to their senior VP of HR, but if that person has been there for three months, they may not be the decision maker as far as setting an appointment with their employees goes, setting up an enrollment date with their employees. And all of these factors go back to this question on the screen there, what is the goal here? And is my goal really to set up a meeting with the employees? Is it really to set a date for the enrollment with my employees? And if I get into this meeting and I'm determining, you know what, this person is going to need to go talk to somebody else. I need to get in front of, this person is not the actual decision maker for that. Then the goal of my meeting changes. And the goal is not to schedule a meeting with the employees anymore. And let me give you an example. You go sit down with, uh, with, with Susan. And Susan, when you first start talking, mentions that, you know, any decisions she's going to need to bounce off of the owner. And then she mentions that two or three more times throughout your decision. For example, I ask, or throughout the meeting, rather. Uh, for example, I ask later, um, you know, do you do any staff meetings or safety meetings? Well, we do, but I, again, would need to check with the owner before I schedule anything like that. Yeah, no problem. If she's mentioning that multiple times, 
I'm going to get a clue here that she's not my decision maker. She's not the person that's going to say, yes, come in on September 4th, and here's, you know, here's the time for the enrollment. And so the goal of my meeting is changed. It's no longer to set up an, an employee enrollment, although that's typically my goal when I go in. I need to be flexible enough to recognize, hey, this is not the person that's going to do that. And all of a sudden, the goal might be to set up a lunch with them and their, and their boss or with them and the owner or set up a sample presentation for a small number of, people, of decision makers. You know, if, the, if I'm meeting with an HR director and they say, yeah, I'm going to need to get uh, our CFO in on this, I need to get our SVP of HR in on this, great, could we do a lunch? Could you help me put together a lunch with those individuals where we'll bring in lunch and we'll show them a sample presentation? You know, or sometimes in larger companies, we'll set up a lunch with the entire HR department. Let's, let's just give you guys a sample of what this looks like. And then I think it'll be easier to get everybody on board, including your payroll person. And all of a sudden, that might be the goal of my DM meeting. Or maybe just a, you know, have them help, help me set up a, a meeting with the owner. Is there a time that you could help me get back in here and let's, let, me, let me show this to the owner then? So the goal might change throughout the meeting, even though typically I go into every meeting with the goal being I, I want an appointment with the employees. As some of these things, you know, and some of them I'm going to know before because I'll look the person up on LinkedIn, but sometimes the goal is going to change to some other result other than just a scheduled enrollment. I hope that that uh, is helpful and I hope that it makes sense. When it comes to closing, and this is what I mentioned earlier, Another thing that I'm going to have to be determining throughout my meeting, and this is where, where that ABC always be closing really comes in. I, I'm not going to wait till the end of the meeting to do this. But I'm going to try to determine what the enrollment setup is going to be. What is the setting going to be? Is, and, and these three on the screen, these are by far the three most common enrollment settings. Okay, So it's either going to be a mandatory meeting, which is like a, like a staff meeting or a safety meeting, or it's going to be a voluntary meeting where the employees come if they're interested, and we'd set up there like a workshop or a lunch and learn. Lunch and learn is best when it's voluntary because if you feed people, more people show up. Or is this going to be an open enrollment meeting? And notice... Uh, going back to the mandatory meeting there, notice I've got in parentheses pre-existing versus non-pre-existing. So what do I mean by that? I mean, is this, a, is this a staff meeting or a safety meeting where the employees are going to be there whether I show up or not? That's a pre-existing mandatory meeting. And that's what a mandatory meeting is. If the decision maker says, well, we do a staff meeting every Wednesday, but, but I don't there we're usually pretty busy. Uh, we could just do a lunch and learn and just let our employees come to that. And even if the decision maker says, I'll make them all come, eh, that's not going to be mandatory. <laughs> I mean, those, those very, if it's voluntary, if it's not pre-existing rather, it very easily turns into a voluntary meeting. Because they're typically, typically not going to require their employees to come listen to just a benefits presentation. So that's why I prefer, if at all possible, to piggyback on a pre-existing meeting, like a staff meeting or a safety meeting, where their employees are going to be there whether I show up or not. It's already on their calendars. It's, it's already a, a normal function of their work environment. It's just something that they're already used to. And that's where I'm going to get the most access to employees, and you might just jot that down, access is the key. It doesn't really matter how many employees they have. Remember, we, uh, when, we go, when we went over this a couple of weeks ago, I showed you kind of a plan for a six-figure income, and it wasn't the employees, the number of employees at each company that really mattered. It's how many employees you can present to that really determines how much money you're going to make and how many sales you're going to write. Excuse me. So 
so that's mandatory. That's voluntary. Under open enrollment, if we are going to do this through open enrollment, that's fine. And again, I'm not anti-open enrollment. But, uh, but if we're going to do this through open enrollment, then I want to determine what does that look like. Or do they do employee meeting? Like a lot of organizations will you know, have uh, different department meetings for their open enrollment, or they'll do like one big open enrollment meeting that everyone comes to, or they'll do a couple different times that everyone comes to. Or is it going to be like a benefits fair, you know, where I'm going to have to do like tabletop presentations? I've learned this. Uh, of any of those on the screen, benefits fair is probably my least favorite. <laughs> so, and it's not that I don't write business there, but when you've got people coming through an auditorium or a gym or like in a school, for example, or, you know, the lobby of, of, a, of a company, of a business, or sometimes they'll set people up in a, in a conference room. But when you're there, and so is the, you know, the Lincoln financial guy and the AFLAC rep and the Sam's Club people and Costco, I mean, you know, some of these benefits fairs, they've got 10, 15 people there. And when that's the environment, it just becomes more difficult to really dive in, especially when you're doing basically one-on-one tabletop presentations. You're not sitting down, you're standing up. You can't really dive into all the benefits. Those those presentations need to be about 100, you know, two to three minutes, 120 seconds to 180 seconds. I mean, they just need to be fast. And so it's basically a concept sale. You want to have something to incentivize them to sign up today. So like I like to set out, this is a trick I, I borrowed from Chris Evans. I like to set a, a big bowl of those Lint Lindor chocolates out. And then I've got behind the table, out of reach, so they can't just pick them up, but I've got behind the table the little $3 bags of the same chocolate, Lint Lindor chocolates. I'll buy the big bags to fill up my bowl, but then I've got a bunch of those little $3 bags in the back. And that way, as they take a bite of that chocolate and I'm telling them about the plan, I say, by the way, for those who sign up today, you get a, a bag of those Lint chocolates to take home. And we'll put you in a drawing for a $50 gift card. But something that incentivizes them to say, yeah, I'll go ahead and sign up. Because you're not going to be able to get into much detail in a tabletop presentation. You've got two to three minutes. You get the concept sell. And then, again, incentivize them to sign up. And, 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 and if it's a benefits fair, you might have 100 people come through, but you might sell three or four or five apps. I mean, it just you're, you're probably not going to sell a ton. You just kind of have to expect that. So a good follow-up to that, sometimes what I'll do is on a benefits fair, if the decision maker is willing, I'll set up a voluntary lunch and learn. And, and by the way, the reason I would do a voluntary meeting is if they don't do a mandatory meeting. If they say we don't do a staff meeting or safety meeting or whatever, then I'm going to go to a voluntary meeting. But sometimes I'll set up a voluntary lunch and learn for like the week after a benefits fair and then in the benefits fair, I'll have a sign-up sheet with the name and email of, of the employees, and I'll get people to sign up to come to the Lunch and Learn. And that's a lot easier sell in two to three minutes. I'll say, hey, by the way, next week we're doing a Lunch and Learn on Wednesday. Why don't you come out and have a free lunch, and we'll be able to, to go over this plan and really show you what it can do. I think it could really help you and your family. Would you be interested in that? Yes, go ahead and sign up. Uh, go ahead and put your name and email and We'll add you to the Lunch and Learn list. This is RSVPing for the Lunch and Learn. And that, that works because if I can get in front of 100 people at a benefits fair, I can get 50 or 60 of them signed up for Lunch and Learn. Most people are willing to commit for that. Now, you know, it, it's not as hard of an RSVP as if they had emailed the, the uh, HR person to RSVP. So if I have 50 to 60 signed up, I might only have 40 to 45 there. But that's more than I would typically get just having the HR send an email out. I might only get 20 to sign up. So, so I've found that that's a pretty effective way to kind of combine a benefits fair with a voluntary meeting the following week. And again, HR people are usually pretty, pretty willing to allow you to do that because it's in that open enrollment window. So I know I've talked a lot about this, but, but – uh, 
but I'm about to show you my closing language. And this is where the rubber really meets the road. So let's kind of go back. We're meeting with Susan, our decision maker here. And, and I've determined that, you know what, Susan is a decision maker. You know, she's been here at the company for seven years. So she's not just getting her bearings. She's been here for, for a long time. And maybe, you know, maybe there's an owner involved as well, but Susan hasn't mentioned that at all throughout the meeting. So I'm, I've decided I'm going to go for the close. I'm going to go for a meeting here. I'm going to try to set up an employee meeting. And, and I'm going to show you the language for if this is, you know, if, if it's either mandatory or voluntary. And I know that because I've asked Susan, do you do staff meetings? And she either said, yes, we do a staff meeting every month or every week or, you know, every quarter or whatever, a safety meeting once a quarter, or she said, no, we don't. And that's where I'm going to get into this closing language here. So I'm showing you this, this slide. You can jot this down or, or uh, I guess maybe I can send this out in an email too if you don't want to uh, write furiously here. But this is my language. If I've determined that they do a mandatory meeting, so let's say that they do a staff meeting every Wednesday morning at 8, then this is my closing language. And where I would get into this is after I've talked about this is the rate, isn't it a good deal, 50 to 70 percent of employees sign up, no wonder it's such a good deal, and they're saying, yeah, it sounds really good, then I'm going to naturally transition to, well, Susan, I know that you guys – you mentioned that you all do a staff meeting every Wednesday morning at 8. Do you mind if I look at my calendar? And I'm just I'm sharing this question with you all today. This has been, this is my million-dollar question. This is really it. I mean, this is the question that I have closed a considerable amount of business by just asking a very simple but yet straightforward question do you mind if I look at my calendar? Or would you mind if I looked at my calendar? And I've learned it's forward enough that it's going to allow me to close, but it's not too pushy. It's not too forward. It's not too direct. It's assumptive without being pushy. And that's why I love that question so much. Do you mind if I look at my calendar? I don't know that in 17 years of, of business, that, that's how long I've been doing this business, I don't know that I've ever had someone say, no, no, definitely don't look at your calendar. <laughs> I mean, now, now there might have been a couple cases where I say, hey, I know that you mentioned that you do a staff meeting every Wednesday morning at 8. Do you mind if I look at my calendar? And they say, well, I'll tell you what, let me, let me bounce this off of my boss. First. I don't see where it would be a problem. I just want to bounce it off of him. And that's okay. Now, I, at that point, I might still go for a tentative date. Because in my opinion, having a tentative, walking out with a tentative date is better than no date at all. So I, I might say, for example, oh, yeah, no problem. And I'm never pushy on it. I always say, oh, sure, yeah, that's no problem. Do you mind, though, if maybe I look at my calendar and I can give you a couple dates that I know would work for me that you could bounce off of, of, of your boss? And, and again, now, if at that point they say, well, before we talk about any dates, I just really want to talk to him, no problem. I'm going to – and I am good with that. But you know what happens most of the time? They say, oh, yeah, that's fine. Sure. And I might look at my calendar and, and give her – uh, give him or her a couple of tentative dates that I know might work. And we might be able to kind of set on a tentative date. And I might, and this is how that would sound. I would say, so uh, Wednesday, this coming Wednesday would, would be really difficult for me. Next Wednesday, let's see, that would be the 28th. That one could work. The Wednesday after that is the 4th. That one is definitely open if you want to ask him about the 4th to see if that might work. And they say, yeah, sure. And I'll say, and if, you know, if it's okay with you, let me pencil that in so I don't schedule it over. I don't schedule anything over that. Would that be okay? Sure. And what do I have now? A tentative date, Wednesday the 4th. Now, again, a lot of times they don't even raise an objection. 
I say, you know, you mentioned you do a staff meeting every uh, Wednesday morning at 8. Do you mind if I look at my calendar? Sure. That, the vast majority of the time they say sure. And I'm going to pull out my calendar. It's going to sound very similar to that. So this Wednesday would be pretty difficult. Next Wednesday, I could make work. Actually, the Wednesday after that, the 4th, is wide open for me. How does that look for you? And I want them looking at their calendar. That's the goal here. Now, notice what I'm doing there. All I'm doing is I'm trying to mirror what I think they might say. The reality is this Wednesday would be fine with me, <laughs> and I'm okay with that. But I know that they probably have a pretty full agenda already for this week's meeting. And that's why I say this Wednesday would be kind of tough. Next Wednesday I could make work, but the week after that, the fourth, is wide open. How does that look for you? Because I'm, I'm guessing that that's probably how they would say it as well. This Wednesday would be tough. Next Wednesday we could probably make work, but the Wednesday after that would be perfect. Now, the reality is, if, you know, today's the 19th, this Wednesday's the 21st, and next Wednesday's the 28th, I might push harder for next Wednesday if I needed the counters in August, too. That's the other thing I would take into account. So, you know, in this real-life scenario, if I were meeting with them today, I would say, this Wednesday I could maybe make work, but next Wednesday, the 28th, looks great. How does that look for you? And then I can get that business in, make it effective September 1st, and it could count for August, if I needed it to. So I've done that many times as well. Um, but again, I'm trying to kind of mirror what I think they're going to say. Now let's talk about this voluntary meeting. If I've determined that they don't do a staff meeting, they don't do a safety meeting, which many companies don't, what language am I going to use for a voluntary meeting? Hey, Susan, I know that we had talked about doing a lunch and learn. Is there a day of the week that might work well to do that? Maybe like a Wednesday or a Friday? That language there is so crucial. Now, I'm going to tell you, some of y'all, the problems that you've had with decision maker meetings is you haven't used language like this at all. All you said is, I'll follow up with you next week, and we'll see if we can put something on the calendar. And it was easier to take that out because there wasn't going to be any rejection in that. And that's what you've been doing. And I'm trying to give you language here that you can actually close a meeting. Is it going to work 100% of the time? No. For me, it works about 25% of the time. About one out of four decision makers that I meet with, I'm able to set an enrollment on the spot. And one out of four is enough to make a solid six-figure income. But one out of 10, it's going to be a lot tougher to make a six-figure income. And that's why I'm trying to give you language here that you can use. Now, you don't have to say it exactly like me, but if you do say it exactly like me, it'll probably work for you. This is one of those things that actually memorizing this language and saying it in a particular way is a good thing. Listen to this, this line. For example, we talked about doing a lunch and learn. Is there a day of the week that might work well to do that? There's a big difference in saying that and is there a day that might work well. That's a little too forward. And when you say, is there a day that might work well to do that, that's when they kind of put the brakes on and say, oh, yeah, let, let, me, let, me, let me just do a poll with my employees or let me talk to my boss. Or, you know, they... They're just not quite there yet. They're almost there. But you pushed them a little too hard. This, what's on the screen here, is a little bit softer. Is there a day of the week that might work well? And then suggest a couple days, maybe like a Wednesday or a Friday. And you watch what happens. Here's what they say. Yeah, actually, uh, you know, Wednesday, you know, Wednesday would probably work. Friday's probably not good because, We've got a lot of people that take off Friday, but, but something in the middle of the week, like, you know, Wednesday or Thursday. Okay, great. And then guess where I go? Million dollar question. Do you mind if I look at my calendar? Sure, that'd be fine. And, and guess what I'm going to say? So you said Wednesday. This Wednesday would be kind of tough. Next Wednesday I could probably make work, but the Wednesday after that would be perfect. How does that look for you? <laughs> 
in a voluntary meeting, with a voluntary meeting, it's maybe even a little bit more important to shoot a week and a half to two and a half weeks out because you're going to need some time to advertise for it. With a staff meeting, if they said this Wednesday is, is good and they'll give you 15 minutes, then that's fine as long as it works in your schedule because their employees are going to be there already anyway. But if today is Monday and you say, hey, how about we do a lunch and learn tomorrow, <laughs> it's just not enough time for them to to get commitment from their employees, to get an RSVP out, you know, and, and it's too short notice for the employees. So that week and a half, two weeks is, is going to be more important if you're doing a voluntary meeting like a lunch and learn. But again, I'm going right back to the same million dollar question. Do you mind if I look at my calendar? And I'm just, I'm trying to give you all language here that you can use to go close a decision maker meeting this week. Now, here's what you're going to need to do. You're going to need to practice this. If I was in a room with you and we were all together in a room, I would have you turn to your neighbor right now and practice this. It's, I really believe it's that important that you actually get this language down, that you become comfortable with language that's going to work. Now, I am not saying this is the only way to close a meeting. I'm not. Because Scott Brooks has a different way of closing, and Dave Perperno has a different way of closing. I mean, we all have kind of our own. But this is language that does work. And it's exact language that works. And so if you were to go replicate this, I think that you would be well off to do that. I think that that would be a smart decision to take this language. And then if you eventually, you know, changed a word or two to make it your own, that's fine too. Or if you found something that you prefer, that's fine. I'm not saying this is the only way to do it. I am saying that people struggle here, and I said this at the beginning, this is an area where even experienced salespeople can struggle because they don't have the language that works. And that's why I'm trying to give you words that work, the language and, and a closing option that works. Now, it does take a little preparation, and, and it's throughout the meeting that you're finding some of these things out. Like, do they do a mandatory meeting, and is this the person that really is going to make that decision? But when you get to that point that it is, and it is the real decision maker, then by all means, you need to close them. And coming out of a decision maker meeting and saying, man, that was a great meeting, it's a great meeting if you got a date for the enrollment. Okay, so, because uh, I'll get that every once in a while. I'll have someone come out and say, that was a great meeting, great decision maker meeting. I'll say, great, when was the enrollment set for? Or when do you have the enrollment? Oh, well, we didn't quite set it yet. I'm going to follow up, uh, you know, next week and we're going to set the enrollment. Okay, that's fine. And then you're going to have some of those. I'll talk about that next. But that's not a great meeting. That's a good meeting. That's not a great meeting. A great, me a great meeting is you set the enrollment. Now, again, to clarify, I'm not saying that that's going to be 100% of the time. Again, my, my closing ratio, one out of four, which means that 75% of the time, I'm not setting a, setting a date. And, and so that's what I want to talk about next. But I just want that closing ratio for you to be as high as it possibly can. And that's why I'm so adamant on taking this and learning it, because this works. I know it works. I've done it many, many, many times. And I've trained other people to do it, that they've gotten results as well. So it works. So if you'll learn this approach and you can get your closing ratio to one out of four, some of you will be one out of three. You'll be better than me. Some of you might be one out of five. That's okay as well. You can still make a solid six-figure income. But if you're one out of 10 or one out of 15, you need to improve that. And I'm trying to teach you how to do that. That's why I'm spending time here. Now, again, if, if my ratio is one out of four, 75% of the time they're not closing, that doesn't mean that 75% of the time they're not interested. In fact, very rarely are they not interested. I could probably count that on one or two hands. How many times in 17 years someone said, yeah, this doesn't sound very good. I'm not interested. <laughs> you know, that's, that's pretty rare that they're just flat out not interested. I mean, it happens, but that's pretty rare. So the 75%, most of the time they are interested. But, they weren't able to set a date. You determine, you know, maybe this is someone that, that uh, you know, is not the actual decision maker or something like that. So that's what I want to talk about here are some strategies 
for having alternative options, some some other options to actually setting a date uh, with the employees. When that doesn't happen, when it doesn't work, what are some other options there? Well, I would say this. You always, if you're going to follow up, and again, 75% of the time I am, so it's, uh, this is not... This is not like you're going to close 9 out of 10, but this is the 1 out of 10. This is the majority of time. I just want that, I want that closing number to be as high as it possibly can be. That's what I'm, I'm stressing here. But on, on the majority of these cases where you are going to follow up, schedule a day and time to do that. Don't just say, I'll follow up next week or early next week. That's bull crap. That's not, that's not a good enough schedule for you. That's not a good enough al uh, alternative for you. Excuse me for being a little bit blunt here. So, but, but you've got to have a day and time. So you can start there. You can say, I'd love to follow up early next week. Would maybe Tuesday work for you? Uh, yeah, Tuesday would be a good time to follow up. Let me go ahead and put it in my calendar here. What time of day? Maybe, maybe 10 a.m. Would that work to follow up with you? I'm going to schedule a follow-up appointment and by the way, when I get home, I'm going to send them, I like to send them a, 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 an Outlook reminder. So that, that pops up on their computer 10 minutes before I call them. And I'm going to put it on my calendar. I'm going to call them at that exact time. Now, I might still get a voicemail. But the chances of me getting through to that person are much greater if I've got something on their schedule, on their calendar, than if I just say, hey, I'll call you early next week and... and I'll pick a day and time. That's, that's nonsense. I want to schedule a time. Again, maybe that's a follow-up, or can I go ahead and schedule a sample presentation for other decision makers? We talked about that. You know, sometimes that's their HR department. Sometimes that's the owner and their boss or the CFO. You know, who else? If, if you determine that this is not the sole person that's going to be able to have – that has the authority to say yes – here, here's the date and time with my employees. If you determine that they're not the sole person, how can we get in front of the others? Because what does not work, usually, is that decision maker saying, let me take this and I'm going to go and I'll tell the owner. There's a difference between a decision maker that's been there for 25 years saying, I, you know, I'll get the owner to sign off on this. And let me go present to them. There's a big difference there. Because someone that's been there for a long time, to get the owner to say, sure, you can do that, that's, that happens. What does not happen very often is a decision maker says, great, now that I've heard from you for 20 minutes, I'm a subject matter expert here. Let me go present this to two or three people and get their yes. That doesn't happen very much. And so I want to, if possible, now it's not always possible, but if possible, I want to set a time that I can present to them. And lunch works really well there. You know, is there a day that I could just bring in lunch? Or, you know, and I'm happy to take them out to lunch, but on these, I actually prefer to bring lunch in. I'll get Jason's Deli or something like that, and I'll bring it in, and I'll sit down with those three or four people. And sometimes I'll do a sample presentation. I'd love to just show you a sample workshop, what I would show your employees in that lunch and learn. I'd love to show that to you and your boss and, and maybe the CFO. And I'll try to get that sample presentation set up. That has worked many times when, I've when we've discovered that the person that we're meeting with initially probably is not the ultimate decision maker, as in, yes, here's a date and time to come meet with my employees. We schedule, schedule that second meeting, that sample presentation, for them and their other decision makers. And then, of course, this key question right here that we ask far too seldom what else can I provide you that will help us move forward? This is not a bad question in a decision-maker meeting, but it's a great question when you're following up. And then when you go follow up with that decision-maker, okay, now let again, I've scheduled a day and time. That first follow-up very, very well like, uh, may very well be on the phone. But if I call them at that day and time, and I don't get them, I get their voicemail. I might try them a little bit later in that day or the next day one additional time. 
on you know by phone but don't be afraid if if you're not getting through on the phone and it's been a couple of days and they haven't called you back don't be afraid to get back in your car and drive over there again and get in front of them Brian Fahili teaches that religiously it's harder to say no to a set of eyeballs than it is a voicemail it, it's so easy in our day and age to ignore an email or a voicemail so I might start there with you know a voicemail if they don't answer the phone at the appointed time I might follow up with another phone call and an email would be good just to let them know that I've, I'm still there I want to I want to follow up like we had agreed I'm not gonna be rude about it I'm not gonna be hurt by it I'm not gonna show pain in my email I'm not gonna say you know I told you I was gonna follow up this morning at 10 I called you at 10 I got your voicemail I don't know what's wrong I don't know why you're ignoring me I don't know what you know did, did you did you uh, read something on the internet or you know <laughs> I'm not gonna take it personally the reality is most of the time the vast majority of the time they're still interested they just got busy and that frankly is why I want to close it on the spot as often as possible that's why I try to get at least one out of four to close on the spot because as soon as you walk out of their office they got 50 other things that jump on their plate and and, and it's you know they're just busy HR people especially they just wear so many hats they have so much going on that's why I try to close it when I'm right there because that's when it's top of mind for them but if I can't and I follow up and I get their voicemail I'm not offended by that I'm not hurt by that I, but after a, a couple days if I'm not getting through to them I'm gonna get in my car and I'll drive over there again now you can't do that just show up for no reason so that's where you know maybe another piece like the uh, I'll show you here going back to our legal shield store uh, let's search what is that called um, uh, needs maybe legal needs analysis Oh, legal needs of American families that's what it's called where is it here oh I'm not seeing it um, I know that it's on here or at least it used to be yeah maybe it's not um, but, but that legal needs of American families let me go to let me see if I can find it in LS engage there it is legal needs of American families so you maybe maybe they don't print them on the legal shield store anymore but you can get this printed at, at a UPS store this is a great document now some people like to use this in their actual decision maker meeting I found that this is a great document for follow-up it's a third-party study that Legal Shield paid for, but it was uh, conducted by Decision Analyst uh, Company right here in Dallas, actually, I, I believe. But they uh, they conducted this survey and basically put numbers to facts that we already knew, which is people can't afford attorneys and are stressed out by legal issues, and this product can help them. <laughs> and so, but it, it's a really good piece to go in person and bring to that decision maker when you're following up and here's what you'll find is when you show up and say hey, is Susan in I just had something I wanted to drop off to her and by the way that receptionist might know you now because you've been there before you've met with Susan before and if you were really on top of your game you brought a mug of chocolate for the receptionist as well so now he or she likes you but they say yeah let me just get Susan up here and Susan comes out here's what Susan's gonna say hey I got your voicemail I'm so sorry I didn't call you back um, but we do want to move forward I, I, I did talk with them you know whatever I and mean, there are so many times where and maybe they're not ready to move forward yet I am checking on it still and all I'm all I say is that's no problem I wanted to drop you off this little piece here this was a study that was done I just thought you'd be really interested in that and I would love to is there another time that I could follow up with you how about later this week and again schedule a day and time the more that you can schedule versus leaving that open it open-ended I'll just I'll just call you back later this week that's that's junk that does not work schedule a day and time and you're gonna be better off in getting results okay Whew. now that I've yelled at you for the last two hours <laughs> I think that I've covered what I want to cover let's uh, let's go to questions and again I'll just ask you to submit any questions through the panel here looks like we've got a number of questions let me get to them to expand this here okay um, all 
I love it. I love it. Uh, okay, good good question from Marguerite. She asked uh, when we're talking about reportmyactivity.com. Um, you you won't be able to see your own charting. We'll have to do that one on one with you. Um, so so that won't show up. The reportmyactivity.com is just for entering those uh, the, the numbers, entering the results that you're seeing. Um, Jennifer Stroll asked a really good question about AFLAC. Uh, AFLAC was already here. Objection. I'm assuming she says that we hear this frequently. I'm assuming. Jennifer, that maybe AFLAC didn't go very well. Maybe that's what you're saying. Because um, the truth is, I love it when you say, what kind of benefits do you offer? And they say, we have AFLAC. Oh, that's awesome. That's like the best thing I can hear. Because that shows that they're open to voluntary benefits. But I'm assuming what you're saying is, sometimes you'll, you'll talk about this and they'll say, yeah, we had AFLAC here and it didn't go real well. Um, and, and again, I just think the best way to overcome that is getting them sold on the benefit itself. And and uh, and you can say you can add to your presentation a great way to overcome that before it arises is, you know, when you're talking about the cost and when you're talking about um, the the benefits, you can say it. You know, you can see here these are things that employees can use. Like I might mention this at the will. You know, one reason why so many people sign up is they need a will, and that's what separates this from AFLAC and, and other benefits that you could offer is. Yeah, this is not just sign up just in case you have a problem. This is sign up and save a thousand dollars your first month. No wonder we're seeing 50, 50 to seventy percent participation. That's how I would try to overcome that before it it uh, it comes up. Uh, Joni asked a question about going to the Legal Shield store. Do you need your associate number, uh, Joni? I believe that you would need your associate number if you wanted to use marketing dollars. I don't believe that. I know you would. You would need it to. To use marketing dollars, but if you're just buying them straight up, I don't think that you do need an associate number. Although I'll give myself it out and say I might be wrong on that. You just have to try it and, and see. But uh, but but obviously, you know, we go there, we spend a lot of marketing dollars there, and there you would need to uh, have your associate number. You actually you 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 click on marketing dollars, and then you log in with your Legal Shield associate login. And so I don't know that you actually enter your associate number, but you do have to have your login to be able to use those marketing dollars. Um, Valerie asked a great question about uh, nonprofit organizations. Can you do that as a self-pay group? And Valerie, again, I'll give myself an out here and say the best place, to, the best way to check that would be to call client services. But I believe that you can. Now they might pay it as earned. I think they pay. That's one of those that they pay as earned. But I, I think that you can do a nonprofit organization and offer them the group rate. I always give myself an out because things change, and and but I know we've done that before. Again, it might be a as earned group, but just check that with client services. But I don't see any reason why, um, why you could not do that. Uh, Joni asked another question about um, selling in states that we're not licensed in. So you do have to be licensed. And it's not, it's, it, it has to do with where the employee lives. So if you're doing an enrollment, for example, in Virginia, even though you don't, you know, you might not live in Virginia, and even if the company is not based in Virginia, but they have a Virginia office, if you've got employees who live in Virginia, then you would need to get that Virginia license. So it has to do with where the employees live. Now you could, uh, you know, use someone there local to do the presentation, and and or you know, just use them. You could do the presentation if you wanted, and and use somebody local. But you could use someone that does have a Virginia license, and you could split that fifty-fifty. As long as you would have to set up a commission share, and you can put on the commission share all Virginia applications follow this 50-50 split with me and the licensed associate. And um, yeah, that's another way to do that. In every licensed state, you can do that except for Mississippi and Massachusetts. Those two, you have to be licensed to get any commissions on a legal plan. So, uh, but that's another way to do it. Of course, Virginia, I use that as an example. That's an easy one. That's, you go online, you pay 50 bucks, and you have to answer the one question test. 
which is, do you have $50? And if you can say yes, then you get the license. And you print it out like 10 minutes later and send it to Legal Shield. It's a real easy one. Okay, let me uh, go here back to our questions. Um, uh, Jim Ryman asked, can I do a screenshot? Jim, I'm, I'm assuming that you're talking about the language, and I, sh I, I will actually copy that language, and uh, I'll put that in my email this week that I send out to everybody, that closing language. My, I might just do a PDF of it. Um, uh, then Joni asked about signed applications. How do you submit those? So, uh, you know, I'll refer you, Joni, to the video on group paperwork in our back office. And that's a, that's a video, by the way, that we're going to be putting on the Legal Shield LS Engage back office. We're going to make that available to everyone. It's been available to our team, but we're going to make that available to everyone soon, like, like in the next couple of weeks. Um, the, uh, but, but that video talks about ways to submit business. And by far, the most popular way right now to submit business is just going and entering it on Legal Shield at work. That's the easiest way. And actually, if you're doing that, you don't need a signature. Because, and once you enter it at Legal Shield at work, you're just typing in the field. And then you don't have to send the form after that. You just keep the form or destroy it is the best. But, um, but you don't have to send the actual signed form to Legal Shield. So in cases like that where you're doing it on Legal Shield at work, you don't even need a signature. And where that can come in handy is like Brian Fahili talks about doing uh, enrollments over the phone where he's calling people and enrolling them over the phone. He's not going to get a signature on that, obviously, but he doesn't need one because he's entering those at Legal Shield at work. Now, if you're going to enter the applications from uploading, where, you know, I don't know why anybody would mail in, in today's time, just scan them and upload them. You can scan them with your smartphone and upload them. That's kind of like if you can't do them on Legal Shield at work for some reason, that would be your plan B. And in those cases, you would need the signature signed. Uh, but it would just be as simple as scanning them and uploading those through your Legal Shield back office. Again, I would I would encourage you to go look at the video where we where we really break that down. Um, let's see. Lita Cross Gray says I could have used some of these techniques this morning. I'm sorry, Lita, uh, about this morning. But here's the great news tomorrow and next week and the week after and the month after you're going to have them. So <laughs> that's good. Uh, Marguerite says, when the decision maker likes the plan, can we enroll them on the spot with the app and then set an appointment with the employees? And she says, because it might take, you know, a few weeks, and in, the, in that process, they, the decision maker might be using the plan. Marguerite, the answer is sure. Yeah, you can do that. The problem is you'd have to enroll them at the individual rate because you don't have enough to open the group yet, and that can create an issue. Even if you found a way to enroll them at the group rate, I, I, I would say that the cases where I would want to do that are very few and far between. And it would be like if a decision maker said, actually, I would love to sign up for this before the enrollment because I've got an issue right now that I need to use it for. That's where I would do it. I typically am not going to push for that, though. And, and here's the biggest reason why. I want that decision maker signing up in front of the group. That's what I want. That's what I prefer. I want the decision maker up in the front of the room filling out his or her paperwork, and I want all the other employees seeing that. That It just creates such a positive dynamic for the group. So that's why I would prefer to do it that way. Um, Donna mentions uh, having a hard time bringing up reportmyactivity.com. Just keep trying. It, it's working. So Make sure it's all one word, uh, no, no spaces, reportmyactivity.com. And uh, let's see here. Valerie asked a good question about identity theft plans, and, and uh, Aflac and other companies do have identity theft as an offering. What you'll find is most companies, if it's just an offering, they don't really push it. Like some insurance plans have an identity theft offering as well. I can't tell you how many meetings I've done where other companies that offer an identity theft plan are there, and they don't even mention their identity theft plan because they know that it pales in comparison to what we do. And like I've had AFLAC reps, for example, say, we offer an identity theft plan, but this guy's is better. Like at an open enrollment meeting, listen to, to this guy because his plan is better, you know, or something to that effect. 
is pretty cool. So usually they they understand that. But again, it goes back to people skills and you know building relationship with other vendors as well. Um, let's see. I'm just kind of going down through here. Jennifer Strobel, I know that we're at 12:32 here. Let me just answer a couple other questions. Since the transition from Kroll to in-house investigators, do you find it helpful to include that in the decision maker meeting? And how would that sound? So I never. Well, I don't. I can't say never, but for the last few years, I haven't really highlighted Kroll much anyway. I just say we have licensed private investigators, and so I don't know that highlighting that they're in-house really makes a difference either. Just the fact that they're licensed private inve private investigators, to me, is is the most significant thing. Um, okay, have you ever gone back? One one last question here: Have you ever gone back to a company that said they weren't inter interested? Um, and what if info, if any, do you send if they ask for that prior to a decision maker meeting? So yeah, I mean those. Well, if I've had a company that said flat out they weren't inter interested, I might try them back six months later or twelve months later. But I'll be real, uh, you know, transparent with you. I don't spend a ton of time. If they've told, if a decision maker told me, now if it was a receptionist that said I'm not interested, that's a different story. But if a decision maker, when I presented to them, said, no, I'm not interested again, I can probably count those on one or two hands in 17 years, then I'm not going to waste much time with that. I'm just going to wait till that person retires or dies or switches jobs, and then I might go back to that company. So I'm just, you know, not when there are so many companies out there that have never heard about what we do. I mean, if we were saturated, I would feel differently about that. But 75 of the company, 75 percent of the companies that you talk to, have never heard a presentation before. So go get them. Go find the low-hanging fruit. There are companies out there that'll say yes right now. They just need to hear from you. Go get those on board. And I know it might not feel that way sometimes, because you call and you call and you call and you call, and you get you know people that aren't interested or they're saying no on the phone. It, but you just have to get past that and realize, actually, there are a lot of people out there that are very interested. And a lot of times when they say no, it's not because they're not interested, because they don't even know what they're not interested in. It's that they're busy or they've had a bad day or they're stressed out. That's why you got to make the calls. That's why you got to do the volume. You've got to do the numbers, because you're not just finding people that are interested. You're finding people that say yes because they, they uh, are having a good day or they're willing to meet. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's different criteria that go in to a decision maker saying, yes, let's meet. That's why on cold calls, it's, you know, one out of 50 that you get a yes from. More market, obviously, that's a lot more, a lot better percentages. But that's, you know, that's, you, you just have to know, even though on the front end, you got to do a lot of calls or a lot of stop in to get one yes or to get a this decision maker to say, yes, let's sit down. The reality is most of them are interested. And most of them have never heard of what we do. And when they do hear about it, they like it. And that is the case. That, that's why right now it's so crucial to increase, uh, increase our, our um, activity on the front end. Okay, um, I gotta let you go here. We're five minutes over, I apologize for that. I really do appreciate every one of you uh, being on the webinar and participating. And I appreciate the questions. I appreciate your interaction. Um, and more, more importantly than anything, I appreciate your commitment to doing this business. The activity reports that we're, that we're receiving show that you do care about your future and that you want to, to make this business work. And I just want to encourage you, again, there are people out there right now that are waiting to say yes. They may not know it yet, but they're waiting to say yes. They just need a phone call from you. And there's, never a, 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 there's not a more important time of year for prospecting than right now. So I would encourage you to really double down on that this week. Let's get this message out there, and, and at the end of the day, let's help, uh, let's help people with these products. God bless you all. Thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate you, and uh, we'll talk to you next week.